a quick little bit of business right here a little shout out to kill cliff thank you guys for uh supplying me with these delicious cbd and energy drinks this is the joe rogan special with the pineapple and the jalapeno very delicious i'll be drinking during our little chat you gotta send me some of those huh? oh i will You're, are you in la <laughs> I'm in San Diego. San Diego. I'm actually going down there this weekend to hang out with my buddy Adam D. And uh, I'll bring some. If I run into you, we can, you know, <laughs> I'll hand you some. <laughs> but anyway, um, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the RRBG podcast. I'm here with Scott Ian Lewis of Carnifex. How are you, brother? Doing well, man. Thanks for having me on. For sure. For sure. You guys have a, a new album coming out. September 3rd, Graveside Confessions. That's it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look like you're in a graveyard right now. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just in our studio. You know, this is where we did the record. Okay. Um, we we did the record, uh, you know, through the lockdown, through the pandemic, and pretty much just did it on our own, just the four of us uh, right here in the lab. Spent, I guess, about a year on it, like, you know, 10, 11 months on it. The, pretty much the duration of the pandemic lockdown type of situation, right? Yeah, we started, you know, we got our uh, our headline tour got canceled like uh, March 12th or 13th. And then we pretty much started working on the record a couple weeks after that in April. And then we turned the record in, in uh, at the end of March the next year. So Okay, okay. Well, and, and not to get too into it like right away into some kind of dark shit, but you know you you were pretty vocal about uh the damage the financial damage that the cancellation of that tour did for you yeah you know and little did i know that it was going to start us off on in such a tough spot you know for such a long time yeah you know at first oh yeah we'll, we'll rebook for the summer you know and you're like okay yeah june we'll be back out there that's no big deal right yeah. uh you know june became september september was november no you know and then people just stopped trying and was just like yeah when you hear from me that's when you're going back on the road you know so there was like a period of like six months i think like kind of that late summer through the last half of 20 and the beginning of 21 where it was pretty bleak as far as like you know hearing if if uh we're going to be going back on the road anytime soon so it financially as a business yeah it was a brutal year for us uh but the good thing is we just throw ourselves into the record and as tough as everything else was um we just said hey look we're we're not gonna waste this time and wallow i mean we we'll do plenty of that but we're also <laughs> gonna write a badass record that'll stand the test of time or you know regardless of any pandemic and so that that was really what we try to counterbalance with for sure, for sure. So you got to do something, man. Because yeah, the, the, a lot of people don't get that. Uh, you hear all si all sorts of arguments on either side of what this lockdown situation is, and get the vaccine, don't get the vaccine, whatever it is. You're fucking mm -hmm. up livelihoods for people that entertain you. That's what's going on <laughs> right now. The people that are making music, the people that are doing live shows, not whether it's music or, or wrestling or whatever it is. There's no like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and now we're kind of in this time where there are shows or some tours happening, but you see them drop and they're dropping again. Like I, today I turned my phone on. It's like, oh, Nine Inch Nails just canceled their whole tour because nope, we're not yeah, ready. Yeah, Jeff Jones as well. Jeff you Jones, know, yeah. I'm, yeah, I don't know what to say to that i guess it's different when you're a band of that size like i i don't know what it's like to be you know, you know like a pop rock band like on that level um mm -hmm. so i'm sure they, they have a lot of different factors also i bet you those guys are are not broke you know oh, no, so no. <laughs> it's not really a situation like it is in the metal scene uh you know certainly with carnifex where we're pretty much hand to mouth you know what we make on the show that pays a bill pays the bills and then what's left goes to the four of us and it's like you know we can't just take a year and a half off and be chill like you know we're just not that kind of band we just don't do that kind of business you know we got to be on the road so yeah yeah we're looking forward to september september 3rd to october 24th we're we're out there grinding bringing live entertainment to the peeps that don't want to participate so that's that's what we can do so that's what we're doing hell yeah man and you know and for people that are watching or listening that aren't that didn't see the article or haven't heard like we're not talking you know a couple hundred bucks this was and i hate to rehash it because it's a shitty situation oh. <laughs> but it's like that yeah. was like a 
hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Where yeah, you know, I would be done. I'm done. I'm tapping out. I'm bankrupt. We're over. It's over. That's it. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's done. <laughs> nah, it, it was brutal. You know, we had over six figures in guarantees. That's oh, money that God. was done deal. We had the contracts for it. All you got to do is go play. That didn't include back in. You know, there's a lot of shows that where, you know, we were expecting them to do well. Where you get additional money. We had sold over 700 VIP tickets already. Jeez. And the VIP tickets are kind of like the cherry on top when it comes to making money on the road. Like, because it's just the artist's time, you know, there's a really great return on those. You know, we'd sold 700 of those. Um, we'd printed $45,000 worth of merchandise and it was ready to go. Uh, didn't play a single show. Uh, you know, already paid uh, over eight grand for the deposit on the bus the first week. Didn't step foot on it. Uh, rented a seven thousand dollar light package for the tour. Didn't put it on stage once. Uh, of course, we paid for all these things. <laughs> uh, you know, I had the sound engineer and the LD and the merch. They all had flown to the house already. We we're ready to go, uh, and it didn't happen. So we went from thinking we were gonna you know, gross about a quarter to being in the hole about 70 G's in a matter of 12 hours. And it's ridiculous right now, a year and a half later, we, we paid about 50 of that off. So we still, we still got about 20 K we're, <laughs> we're hacking through. So that's the follow up on that story. It turns oh. it out. Uh, it was a tough spot to start the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, hopefully I think with the new record, that'll, you know, help chop some of that off and, 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 you know, uh, upcoming tours that, you know, cross your fingers. Uh, the wish I, I, I was joking around with uh, Tucker from from Thursday about that. We're going to start a booking agency for the pandemic called Wishful Thinking, Wishful, Wishful. Thinking Booking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's appropriate, man. It's yeah. appropriate. I really hope I kind of feel like this this tour we are Dahlia will be OK, like because I know all of us are like working class bands. Like it's going to take, you know, some real problem to like cancel that thing because kind of like you said like yeah like, yeah we weathered the year and a half but um we're, we're out of gas <laughs> like there's there's nothing else to weather at this point if like we have to go through more cancellations uh i don't even want to think about it like it it probably is kind of just like well time to move on fellas <laughs> jeez man yeah i mean i attended my first like large scale live event like i'd done you know i went to the comedy store a couple times in la and you know it, it was weird like, you know separated from people kind of but i did my first live you know we, we went to a uh, new japan here in at the coliseum in la uh, new japan pro wrestling show you know a lot of people and uh nice. it, it's it felt good i felt good to be out and around people but also everyone was apprehensive everyone was like on their guard like hey hey what's up man hey how you doing hey it's like yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah. so you know it, it's i feel like we're getting there i don't want to get my hopes up though because you know how that goes but um going back to the the album a little bit the new album uh you said you wrote it throughout the pandemic so is it safe to say that some of the lyrical content might be influenced by what's going on yeah indirectly i mean indirectly. You know, there's no songs about covid on there or anything <laughs> like that uh but uh you know we don't have a covid track but um yeah it really for uh, I think as artists and maybe at least for myself, I felt very disconnected from everything we did for the last 15 years. Uh, and then kind of, you know, you take in the financial reality and you're like, man, did we even do anything the last 15 years? Cause I'm in a really bad spot right now. Um, right. And then, you know, the vulnerability and the insecurity of like, well, what if touring doesn't come back? Um, I guess, you know, what I invested in my identity for almost half my life is, just over not by my choice or doing right. um and so you get a lot of you know you, you mixed emotion you know regret insecurity vulnerability all that stuff and i've kind of always had that stuff you know the success of the band has really uh helped that um but you know prior to the band it was um you know i didn't have any friends or was i wasn't popular or anything like that so i kind of felt a lot of those you know feelings from uh, a lot younger coming back uh being so isolated from everybody so yeah it was super challenging and i tried to be honest and put that in the lyrics 
And um, I think they're universal feelings too. I think that even though I was going through these feelings as a result of the pandemic, they're not emotions that are specific to the pandemic. You can have mixed emotions and feelings of insecurity at any time. They were just at an all time high for me going through it. For sure. For sure. And I, I feel like a lot of people are going to click to that. You know, they're going to, it's going to click for them because everyone's having a really bad mental time right now. And I, 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 myself included, like I'm, I'm, you know, there's, like I said, I went to that show. It was great. And then I come home from that show and I'm just like, wow, I, I don't know what's going on. Like, I don't, I don't know if we're, I don't think we're ever going to go back to how it used to be. I mean, then I started, it started spiraling. Like, what about all my friends? Like, I'm never going to have those good times I had when I was in high right? school and college. Like, just start spiraling out. That was me for a year and a half, dude. <laughs> just circling the drain. It's crazy. But, you know, I, I'm glad that you're able to at least use it as some kind of fuel to to, to write and, and come up with something new and exciting. Um, you know, I keep mentioning wrestling and whatnot, but I saw you guys recently collaborated with Black Mask Clothing mm -hmm. uh, for, a, for a new shirt. And I mean, that's if anybody's listening, doesn't know that's Malachi Black. There used to be Alistair Black's clothing line collaboration. Uh, you know, t tell me what you think is. Uh, the position of a, a thing like pro wrestling uh, in modern pop culture these days. Like, I feel like it's bigger than it's ever been. Yeah. You know, I think it probably is. Um, I, I certainly remember like when I was young, you know, all the originals, Hogan and Undertaker and uh, Diamond Dallas Page and all those guys, you know, like, um, and I think, yeah, maybe it's kind of come out of the underground a little bit. It's gotten a little, you know, maybe a little more corporatized as well. Um, there's definitely like a formula, I think, for becoming a successful wrestler. And um, yeah, I, I think it's pretty great, though. I've always been the type of person that thought it was good to do this meets that, you know, like we don't just have to be, you know, limited to the deathcore space. Like we can tour with all sorts of bands. We could you know, be a background music or accompanying music for a wrestling event or like a, a motocross event or, you know, whatever. I, I always like when there's any chance to basically, I, I guess, crossover, but, you know, in, in an actual way, meaning like, let's introduce our fans to your fans and your fans to our fans and see what happens. Like, I always think that's fun. How did that, how did that uh, come about? Like who reached out to who there? Um, I think, how did it start? Hmm. I don't know exactly. Maybe Tommy and reached out, you know, Valakai Black, uh, mm -hmm. he, he might have reached out. Um, but to be honest, I don't know exactly how it started. I, re I think he reached out to us, though, because he'd been doing some collabs mm -hmm. and he's a fan of the band. So, you know, it's the first time we've been able to do anything like that with someone in the wrestling space. Certainly, you know, he's super popular, too. So it was a really awesome opportunity. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely, you know, he's got the death metal, death core kind of gimmick going with his character and uh, something that's missing in that world, too. You know, all the wrestlers I see, everybody's a superhero or some kind of some kind of crazy. He's like the the one that's bringing in that death metal, you know, face, yeah. paint, crazy horns. He's got Amon Ra, I believe, is doing their, his uh, entrance music or something like that. So it's cool that he's bringing that into, you know, a bigger light, a, a, a brighter light and i'm glad that he's collaborating uh, yeah, with you I guys agree. you know yeah it's awesome you know i've been seeing you know a lot of bands doing the nxt stuff uh mm -hmm. so it's it's cool to try to see those worlds merge hell yeah hell yeah um so I, I wanted to ask you i was trying to come up with some interesting questions i hate asking the same shit especially when you're in the middle of a album press cycle you know i don't want to get so you know what in who's your influences no like so I, I tried to come up with something unique and and my question that i came up with was these days you know the band's been around for a while uh and what what do you find more gratifying to yourself personally the the fan that's been there from the beginning that knows every single song and knows your whole catalog and everything or a brand new fan that maybe just found you with this new album and they saw your video and now they're now they're hooked. What's more gratifying for you? Hmm. I, you know, I don't know that I could pick one or the other. I think what really what brings me the most joy is when when someone says, "Hey, you know, whatever the song is, right? maybe they heard it a week ago, or maybe they've been listening to it for fifteen years, whatever it is." When someone comes up and they like specifically point out. 
a track, a line, a moment where they said, Hey, like this really impacted me. It, it changed the way I was thinking about this or that, or, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have, be able to have conversations with, with people that have really been in some dark places and said, Hey, you know, reading the, these lyrics and coming to these shows, meeting other people really pulled me out of that. Um, and that's what really means something to me. I, I think, you know, if the music biz is kind of soulless. So if you're here to try to make money, like basically if you just got to screw people over. Um, uh, but if you're here to be an artist, um, it's easy to be sort of underappreciated sometimes by the biz. And so we've really had to let go of like looking for any type of fulfillment that way. And when you're a young band, you kind of think maybe that's where it's going to come from, you know? Uh, but then you, you do realize it's actually the relationships with the fans um, and like actual, like personal relationships, hearing their story and then you telling the, them yours and then relating further. Like those are the things that really make me go, man, somebody is listening. This is worth it. It is worth all this effort. It's not just, you know, silly, heavy music for the sake of, Right, whatever right. like it actually means something to somebody and that's that's what you know as a 36 year old man that's why i could still like take it serious because i know hey somewhere in there music is mattering to someone and even if it's one person that's enough for us right yeah yeah that's the thing people tend to get lost in the you know in that wanting to be famous or popular kind of thing like it, it happened to me i mean i was in a band for 10 years and you know there were times when we would play a show and there was 10 people there and i'd get bummed out instead of getting mm -hmm. bummed out i now as as i'm older i'm almost 40 like i'm looking back i'm like i'm an idiot i should have just embraced those 10 people because right you know you forget <laughs> yeah and I, I mean i you know similar experience too where it's like you maybe you put a record out that you had a you know high hopes for and it doesn't perform or or you're going to do a tour you think is stacked top to bottom and not as many people come out. It's those moments where you really realize like, oh, if I sink or swim on success, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be all over the place and probably just be chasing it rather than living it. Right. And so you kind of just have to say, no, what the, what's really important is the people who are here having a real connection. That's all that matters, whether it's one person or hey, if it's 10,000 people, all the better. But it doesn't make it more worthwhile with more people. What it matters is the connection. Absolutely, man. And I think definitely that if there is any silver lining to all this pandemic bullshit is that uh, I think I'm, you know, there part of it is that I'm getting older, but the other part of it is that I'm learning to appreciate any connection because mm -hmm. we've been isolated for, you know, almost two years. Like any connection I get, it's like, Oh man, yes. Finally, someone I could talk to or someone I can, that understands what I'm listening to or what I'm mm -hmm. you know, enjoying and we can enjoy it together. Like, I think that if there is any positivity out of this whole thing, it's that I think people will appreciate connections more. Uh, people will be a little more excited to go to shows and, and, and support the bands that they like, you know, everybody got a stimulus check. If I can buy a t-shirt or something or get a record, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, exactly. Yeah. Support your bands. Um, you, you know, and we were, you were saying you, you're, you're 36, you said? Yeah. 84. 36. It's, it's, isn't it crazy to think that, you know, I, I was looking at your, your Wikipedia and the formation of the band was in 2005 and, and I, 2005 is 16 years ago. Like that yeah, we're actually almost <laughs> to the day. August 25th was our first rehearsal. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, it's, 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 we're right there. That's that. But you know, how is that 16 years ago? Like 2005? <laughs> I, you know, I see that's the whole, that's kind of the mind fuck of the whole thing. So that's where I was at it was like 2005 to 2020 was a blink of the eye. Like all we did was try to build this band. And then all we did was sit at home for a year and a half. Like it was such a yo yo experience that uh, it was a mind fuck. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm still trying to get, I'm still trying to like, get my bearings you know like i'm no different from anyone else uh, honestly you know i'm still struggling through it i'm just looking forward to get back on tour starting to get some bills paid and you know like you said like get past this time of uncertainty that's like the uncertainty is really what gets you you know yeah yeah 
So now that, you know, it's 15 years of, of working in the same realm of music, the same genre, you know, deathcore or death metal-ish. And how, how do you keep it fresh for yourself when you're writing this new music? Like, are you the type to, are you listening to other bands in the genre to kind of gain inspiration or, or study what's happening? Or are you just kind of isolating yourself and listening to maybe something from the complete opposite end of the spectrum just to kind of keep yourself you know, fresh in that realm. Yeah. Um, you know, when we're working on a record, I actually really don't listen to that much music, uh, and for no other reason in that I'm just like really invested in our record. And, you know, uh, Sean, he, he writes most of the music, uh, him and Corey, they do all the writing and yeah, it's weird. Sean doesn't really listen to anything either. Um, so yeah, I would say really, we just, we're listening to our demos like incessantly because, each song that we write, there's like 10 versions of it. You know, it goes, it goes on a long journey before it's finished. And so I think, you know, when you write, well, we didn't write 15 songs. We wrote uh, 13, but, uh, or 12, when you write 12 songs, 10 times each, you, you actually ha like have a lot of shit to you know, sort through. So I think we're just so involved in that. We're just listening to the demos constantly. And I'm, you know, writing lyrics, Sean's trying to write more music. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't see us really listening to a whole lot of music in that time. And, you know, even if you go back to the first album, we, we really just embraced our influences. Um, you know, we'd never really looked around the room to see what anyone else was writing. Um, we didn't do that in 05. And there wasn't really a deathcore scene in 05, you know, uh, Despise Icon was out there, JFAC was out there, but this is like super early days of social media and all that. So it's it's not like anyone had an online presence. You know what I mean? It was very, yeah. uh, it was just very separated still. It wasn't very cohesive scene yet. And so when we started, we kind of just thought we were just a band. Like we had no idea that Deathcore was going to be a thing and mm. it was going to get all this momentum because, you know, I was in a band that was almost the exact same music as current effects called incinerate in 2002 and we didn't go anywhere you know <laughs> so it's like uh you, you know it's kind of interesting to to just see how like all this stuff sort of happened around us and through it all you know it's kind of interesting it's like sometimes we're we're too death core for the death metal kids and we're too death metal for the death core kids and not extreme enough for the grind kids and it's like we've always <laughs> just kind of had no people, you know, and I, I feel like that's okay. You know, we're just outsiders and our fans are outsiders with us. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. I found you, I, I discovered you guys, I believe it was summer slaughter. I did you, I think you guys played a summer slaughter with like revocation and a couple. Was it uh, 2016? I think so. I think so. Yeah. So that was cannibal corpse. And cannibal now. corpse. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cannibal Corpse, you guys, uh, Revocation. I remember I was backstage with the Revocation guys because those are my, my, my homies. But uh, mm. but I remember watching you guys and I'm like, what? The, who the fuck is this? And they're like, oh, they've been <laughs> around forever, dude. Those are the homies. I'm like, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We kind of been like, you know, the uh, secretly sneaking through all these years, you know. <laughs> we never, uh, I mean, we've never had like the cool manager or anything like that. So we, we, we kind of have always sort of been taking the underground route, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I noticed also, you know, you wear uh, face paint uh, for for the performances, and some of them. I don't know if all of them, uh, but I wanted yeah. to ask. I wanted to ask you, like, what? Who was the first person you saw wear face paint? And and you know, did you draw hmm. inspiration from that person, or was oh, it yeah. something else that that kind of like uh, inspired you to wear that? I mean, I was a goth kid from day one, you know, okay. uh, all through high school, I was a goth kid, probably why I had no friends, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so I've, I, and I got into extreme metal by way of goth and industrial music. You know, I was a huge fan of Manson, Nine Inch Nails, White Zombie, KMFDM, like in, you know, 96 and seven, right in there. And then, uh, I found cruel, cruel, uh, Cradle of Filth when they put out Dusk and Her and Bass and Cruelty and the Beast. Mm, and okay. those two records were really what, um, what put me on the extreme metal path. And so from there, I started listening to a lot of black metal. Uh, Dimmu had just put out Spiritual Black Dimensions. And so that record was just fucking huge to me at the time. Um, obviously, Cannibal, um, Dissection, Immortal, Satyricon, all that stuff was like 
really where the first extreme metal bands I found. And, um, I kind of didn't get the new metal st stuff until later until I like met Sean, uh, cause he's a new metal fan, Corey, he's a new metal fan. Um, so I don't know. I kind of always had been, um, like a goth kid and like Danny filth, Rob zombie, Manson, um, like Tim skull, like all those guys that had always been musicians. I looked up to, mm. um, and then obviously black metal, you, you know, you have a lot of face paint there. And I think we're always like into things that were like, people are like, Oh, you can't do that. You know, you can't put a breakdown and a blast beat next to each other. Okay. Mm. Watch like, me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you can't wear makeup and be a deathcore band. Oh yeah? oh yeah. Well, watch. You know, like I like I kind of we're so over being told what will and won't work that a lot of it's just out of spite. Um, sadly, I don't know. Maybe that's a bad thing. Yeah. But for me, it's kind of like I'm just being myself unabashedly. And if that doesn't fit into the rules of metal, um, all I can say is I never fit into the rules of metal. Like listen to Carnifex uh we're, we're like we broke the rules of metal you know putting two genres together that people say don't work together um yeah so for me it's about just being ourselves and saying this is who we are and it's not some you know grab for popularity it's us expressing our influences and the people that want to come with come with and also i like the character you know yeah a lot of carnifex's themes are there's they're very real but they're super dark and so even when I was writing this record, in order to get there, you want to, you, you got to go there here to get, to make it real. You yeah. know, it's kind of like method acting to a small degree in that there's a part of you that has to live in that space to be able to create there. And on stage is no different, especially when I'm revisiting songs that really have a lot of pretty bad memories attached to them. And I'm doing it night after night. So in order to do that, I, I have to kind of have a character to put on and a character to take off. Mm. Um, and so that's that's really where I think the, the makeup is almost for me in a weird way. Like it sort of helps me separate a lot of uh, trauma from who I am today. That makes sense. That's, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I can relate. I've, you know, I've done that every once in a while. Not, not face paint. Uh, I have done the face paint, but like... Uh, I liked wearing masks and not just cause of Slipknot. This is before, I think it's more linked to like Lucha Libre where mm. when I'm wearing like a Lucha mask, I can just, I'm an animal that's here to kill you. And that's it. Like, there's no, there's no right. emotions. I don't care about your family. Like I'm this, <laughs> you know, like, so exactly. it's a, it's a good, it's good. Like you said, like putting the burden of this like heavy emotional weight onto that character. So it's not killing you personally inside. Um, yeah, and I, I had to learn that to a degree, you know, there's a, a double edged sword to putting a lot of honesty in your lyrics. And the other side of it is you have to revisit them constantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing a, an interview with I think it was Jonathan Davis before they did their their tour uh, about their self titled uh, around their self titled, you know, and he was talking about how, you know, it kind of sucks to have to be up there. <laughs> thinking about all this shit that you you know it was traumatizing stuff you know um, right yeah. yeah but if you you know that's the whole that's kind of the catharsis and the purge of the band i think and that, you know it actually ties in with the theme of the whole album which is you know we carry this stuff aside around us that's actually really pretty toxic and just like the body wants to purge you know when you do see what's drinking or whatever uh you know you got to purge that those toxic emotions too and i think you know the extreme nature of the music the intensity and the and the how caustic it is all of those things are part of that sort of violent purge where it's uncomfortable while you're doing it but when you walk away from it it's it feels a lot better yeah that's what a lot of people that don't listen to metal don't understand they hear they hear the music they think it's aggressive they think it's violent they think it's demonic or whatever but you're not understanding that this is therapy this is it's like a rage room yeah, you're letting it out. You're screaming. You're ah, and then when you're done, you're like, ah, you know, ah, I feel now, better. Now, now I don't need to go punch a random stranger uh, in the street <laughs> because I've released it over here. There you um, go. So, but you never answered it though. You mentioned a bunch, but oh. like, who's the first person you saw with face paint on that you can remember? Oh, uh, I was probably Kiss, like the Kiss? very first. Yeah, probably Kiss. Um, and then after that, I'm trying to think. Um, 
yeah, I guess it was probably like the, the like had to be the goth stuff. Maybe the Cure, you know, Robert Smith. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I remember. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. When I was real, like real young, you know, uh, like I'm talking like 10, 11, 12, you know, you see, you know, Robert Smith wearing some makeup. So I, I guess, yeah, it was really just like goth stuff on MTV at, and then, yeah, Kiss. And I can't really think of anything prior to that, to be honest. Now I got to ask you because I mean, I, I, I identify as gothy. I, I, you know, I've loved goth music. I've gone to goth clubs. I'm also kind of an, like an anomaly where I'm more social, the oop, I lost you for oh, a second. Yeah, I don't know what this is. Let me get rid of this. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. So like I'm one of the weird anomalies of goth where like I'm still kind of social and I like talking to people. Uh but I still have all these, you know, solo moments where I'm I'm bummed out and thinking and listening to, you know, like you said, the cure or something. Or <laughs> VMB Nation. Boys don't cry. <laughs> yeah, man. So uh, but, but you know, all of my gothiness comes from a childhood that went through super strict you know religious upbringings is that the case for you as well were you was your whole family super religious as well or not really um there was a period of time yeah um yeah. i think it was just to mitigate the extenuating circumstances you know like i don't uh, like now i think religion has kind of gotten very politicized but uh back then or at least my experience was it was more just like uh, here's a place where you can be safe where there's no drugs. You know, it was like a okay. thing more than like a religious thing, to be awesome. honest with you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, it was like that growing up. Uh, yeah, it could be like a reaction to that for sure. But yeah. I, I mean, we're kind of, you know, we're not uh, anti-religious. We're just a religious. I He's, mean, it's just. He, he says with it, a pentagram behind him that's lighting up. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's pink. I mean, it's come pink. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How I mean, serious could we be? That was that was really what led me down that path. I remember that I got kicked out. I've told this story a million times in the podcast, but yeah, I got kicked out, and and uh, the first thing I did was my uncle would tell me, "Don't buy that Marilyn Manson. You know, don't listen to that." And I'm like, <laughs> right. Well, that's the first thing I'm doing. <laughs> I was the me, same way. Yeah, you're telling me not to do that. I want to do it. Um, I have a, another silly question for you because I was watching a video yesterday of, of one of your one of your newer videos where you're performing live, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, as I mentioned, I had sang in a band, so I I get the 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 guttural pain that happens when you're up there, you know, gr you know, low end growls. Have you ever shat your pants during a show? No, no, not yet. not yet. All right, that's good. Not yet. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not old enough. I don't know. No, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've had any major mishaps on stage. The one that I can think of, the most major mishap, it was actually on that summer slaughter that you mentioned a minute ago with Cannibal 2016. We were playing uh, the Metro Music Hall in Chicago. So really a pretty big show. And it was mm -hmm. like a weekend, you know, the whole deal. So it was like a couple thousand people there. And we go out and we were playing a little bit later in the night. So it was totally full. But we're also playing in front of like two other back lines. You know, it's like Cannibal's back line and their drum set, then Nile and their drum set. And then everyone else that's playing is rotating through. So we're like way on the front of this stage, like all the way out to the front. And somewhere in the changeover, the, the center monitor had gotten like pushed to the edge of the stage. And it was like teetering. Ooh. just like this but was still sitting flat right so it's just waiting for some unsuspecting vocalist and <laughs> sure enough dude i come out and i i say like one word and then i put my foot on that monitor and i'm i'm gone i'm down i'm in that moat wrapped up in wires like oh no. First. <laughs> oh no and the oh, guys the guys were, were like, you know, they're all doing fucking their super headbang. Like, we got to go hard for the opening of the show. No idea that <laughs> what happened to me. And so, like, literally, I'm just mangled down there. Like, got my bell rug. And, like, the two security guards, like, grab me and just, like, throw me back on the stage. <laughs> and, and, you know, I had my wireless mic, so I just, like, kind of jumped back in it. But, yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. Oh, it was man. literally, like, I, like. Chicago. Like, oh, no. the <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It, it was pretty silly. It didn't feel so good, but that's probably the, 
like the biggest mishap I've had so far. Some some sound guy in Chicago is laughing his ass off because they hate it when singers put their feet on the monitors. <laughs> Oh right, yeah. Well, he's like, yeah, "Ha you see?" <laughs> right, all that yeah. years, all those years of karma came back. Yeah, dude. I, I, I love, I love, I love angry sound guys. It's so hilarious to me. Like they <laughs> halfway, like, oh, stop putting your, you're gonna stop it. I'm gonna turn off, and they just lower your volume and say, like, "Oh my god, just stop." That's why you gotta um, bring your own guy with you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. I used to bring, man. I was so stupid. I used to bring like a whole, like I, I would tell the sound guy, just plug me in. I'll handle the rest, you know, and I had like a mixing board. I thought it was Mike Patton. I had like, you know, pedals and fucking all kinds of shit. And just for a vocalist, I'm like, this is too much. This is excessive. But I did like the fact that I was in control of my sound. Like if, if I was too low and the crowd was like, your mic is low. I'd just be like, mm, and just beep, do it myself. Yeah, I don't yeah. need to, I, I don't need to be on stage. Like, uh, uh, yeah. uh, more yeah. staring the headphones. Come on, man. Um, so, let me ask you about uh, guilty pleasure. Do you have anything that, you know, when people see you, you, you look the part, you know, you've, you've got tattoos everywhere. You, you know, you're, you're living the gimmick as they say. Uh, is there That's anything the people truth. would, yeah, is there anything that people would be surprised to hear that you listen to or enjoy? It doesn't have to be music. It could be just something silly that you do some kind of silly guilty pleasure habit. Guilty pleasure. Uh, I don't know about I don't, that's a strange phrase, but I don't know. Uh, what's something about me people probably don't know? Uh, I really like surf rock, you know? Uh, there you that, go. Like, maybe that's a guilty, I, I yeah. don't feel guilty, but yeah, I really right. like surf rock. Um, okay. What else? If I'm trying to just uh, kind of um, not think, uh, I like watching cooking shows. Ah, okay. Yeah, me too. I'm cooking, I just, learn a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. I, I'm absolutely clueless on cooking. Like, I don't know anything about it. And being on the road for 15 years, like, it was nothing I picked up. Mm. Um, so uh, when watching, like, a you know, a professional chef, like, cook something badass, it's is like, oh, wow, that's how you do it. <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, I guess that. I'm, I, you know, my life is really the band. Uh, it's like I, I just live it and breathe it 24-7. So, um yeah, I don't know. Pretty much the band is where you can find out about me. <laughs> yeah, so if you were to recommend one record for surf rock for people that want to check it out, who what, what are we looking for? I'd go with the Centurions. The Centurions? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, going to look that up today. <laughs> yep. They got a song called uh, Bullwinkle Part 2. Silly title, but it's actually a phenomenal song. And you've probably heard it in a bunch of movies, but that whole record is pretty enjoyable if you like um, that music. And what's interesting about surf rock is it's basically uh, black metal without blast beats. Um, <laughs> okay. it, it operates in a lot of the same modes and keys. So uh, it's actually kind of funny. And I, I, I always love those melody, you know, Phrygian and that scale and, and surf rock's in the same scale. So maybe that's why I like it. Yeah. Hell yeah. For sure. Um, your, your Twitter says that you're a comic series creator. Are you still doing that? Oh, wow. Have you written anything uh, that you, you know, comic wise? Have you written anything? Yeah, I, I released a comic book in 2018 called Death Dreamer. It was a 54 page graphic novel. We took it to Comic Con that summer. Um, well, I, I mean, I like, I mean, like recently, like, if you're doing something recently, because I mean, obviously you did it, but I'm. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I had another, you know, I'm 14 pages into the next book uh okay. the, the script's done i got 14 pages illustrated but i had to put it all on ice back in march because obviously it's an independent book i pay for it off of my tour earnings i haven't had any tour earnings so yeah the the book part you know chapter two has pretty much been on ice for i guess a year and a half now mm, okay okay but you know hopefully you're looking like we were saying. You've got the album coming. Hopefully, yeah. tours are coming. Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. <laughs> yeah, if we, we can stay busy on the road, and if if the fans are are asking for book two, um, then I'm going to try to make it happen for sure. I don't want to just leave it half done. Yeah. All right. Well, brother, thank you so much. I mean, uh, the album's coming out September third. Uh, w would you categorize this you know how like some bands are like this is the heaviest album we've ever made is there a a anything you could say about the album for people that haven't heard anything yet uh i you know i'm very proud of it i i really do love the record 
um, as, as far as like heaviest, I, I couldn't answer that for you. And, you know, everyone can give you a different answer. Sure. Um, but yeah, for me, I think it's really, it, it, it's an extremely honest expression of who we are as people and who we are as musicians. Um, we did the record ourselves. We did it right here in the studio, the four of us. And so I think if you're looking for a record that isn't chasing anything, it's just people, uh, expressing their creative intuition give this one a check. I think you'll like it. Hell yeah, brother. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, everybody that's watching and listening, please pick up graveside confessions when it drops, uh, pre-order it. That's super important. I don't know. If people, is, yeah. I don't think people understand how important they're like, why am I going to pre-order? It's going to sound like it's going to sell out. Like it helps. It helps the bands. <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, what's interesting is each sale, uh, each physical sale, uh, represents like 1400, streams so if you want to really help the band out you can just buy spend 10 bucks and it's like listening to the record 1400 times yeah. <laughs> you know so it goes a long way for us yeah man buy the record don't just stream it on spotify streaming helps it's a nice little thing to do as well but buy the record buy the vinyl i have my wife hates it i have like 400 and something records right now <laughs> I, I gotta stop buying records but every time some one of the bands that i like or have been on the show like yeah we got a new record boom i'm like yep oh, pre-order you know i gotta i gotta support so we got every, a good looking vinyl up right now oh yeah it's oh, a double yeah. lp too nice 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 well go get it uh, uh nuclear blast nuclear blast indie records merch. indie merch yeah it's all the record came out on nb but yeah indie merch uh dot com slash carnifex we got all our goodies there and on social media it's just at carnifex all mm -hmm. across the board so follow them yeah. pick up the record go to a show when it happens in your town and uh thanks again brother i appreciate your time well thanks for having me on man of course cheers Take it easy.